because when you're a player, the biggest thing is, are you playing? If you're playing, you know, the manager's all right. If you're not playing, the manager's, the, the manager's an idiot. <laughs> you know, and that's, <laughs> that, that, that's as simple as it can be. Whereas when you take a step back and when you start to look at the bigger picture and you're not a player anymore, you start to realize the job that a manager has. Welcome in to episode three of The Heart of the Game, the show where we get to know the voices of football. I'm your host, Nate Abarea. You can get at me on Twitter, at Nate Abarea, and be sure to follow at World Soccer Talk. Our guest in this edition of the show is a former Premier League player who suited up for Manchester United and Stoke City, among others, and he now plies his trade as a co-commentator on Premier League matches. You've heard his voice many a times. I speak of our good friend, Danny Higginbottom. In our chat, we talked all about his newfound love for football commentary, his dedication to the craft, his unique relationships with football managers, and Danny shared an absolutely brilliant and highly personal story about the great Sir Alex Ferguson that you are not going to want to miss. So without further ado... On with the show. It's episode three of The Heart of the Game. Danny Higginbottom, what would you say is your favorite part of football broadcasting? What do you enjoy the most about calling matches with the uh, play-by-play broadcasters of the world? Yeah, it's, you know, it's really interesting and it's fascinating because... I enjoy speaking to managers before the games and you get a better understanding of the role that they have, the job that they have and, you know, how difficult it can be at times. Um, And then the games, the games are great as well because it just, it can just be so unpredictable. And I think what you've got to be, you've got to be ready at at any time, you know, to, to, to give a call, you know, as in terms of something you, you, you may agree with, with what the referee's done, something that you don't agree with, or even at times, you know, predicting things before they actually happen so you have to be careful but you know it's it, by and large you know it's it's such an enjoyable thing to do just because of the the simple thing you know I, I love football it's it's something that I've loved since I was I was a young lad and you know to be able to do commentary on the games now is is absolutely brilliant and you just don't know what to expect when that whistle's blown well, Danny, you bring fantastic analysis uh, to the broadcast, and anybody who's familiar with your color commentary, I'm, I'm sure would attest to such. Now, one interesting aspect of the transition from former player uh, to co-commentator is, is the fact that a lot of people, a lot of former footballers have tried it and maybe uh, thought that it would be a little bit easier and then said, wow, that was a lot harder than I realized. <laughs> I have to ask you, uh, through the first few years of of that transition for you, what were the most difficult parts of it, and and why are you still doing it? <laughs> I think you know, a lot of the times the most difficult part can actually be getting the prep right for it, because I think the one thing that you find now is that more than ever, with social media and with everything that's entailed, I think supporters are probably probably more more clued in than they've ever been so you have to make sure that anything that you're going to say any play that you want to talk about you've got to be correct in in how you're doing it and when I first started this you know a few years ago now I I went back to probably being an apprentice so to speak so just wanted to learn from everybody and wanted to be a sponge really and just soak everything in and that meant speaking to some of the co- uh, top commentators speaking to some of the, the the top co-commentators and that was a big thing for me and I think they appreciated that because you know they've been there and done it and they just give you a little bit of an idea about things and and as it's gone on over the years I've just found myself really enjoying it I think it's it's a big thing for me that you know, to try and read the game, you know, see what's going on on the pitch. Obviously, you know, the majority of the time you've got this bird's eye view of the game and it's it's really good. It's really interesting. And when you build relationships up with managers as well, there becomes a big, tr- uh, a big trust aspect. There'll be things that managers tell you that you can't say, which is fair enough. But there'll be other things that they will tell you that they may not necessarily have mentioned to anybody else that you're OK to say. 
And I think that's that's a really big thing for me, you know, building the trust, building the understanding with managers. So therefore, they're giving you really good insight that you can then use in games and then just bringing it all together. The tactical side, obviously, the knowledge that you've been given by by the manager um, and the player side of things as well, you know, knowing a bit about each player. And I think from my perspective, the reason that, you know, I'm still in it is that I really enjoy it. Um, the fact of, like I say, you turn up at a game, you have no idea what to expect. You know, you can't make the game better than what it is. You can't make it worse than what it is. And you just have to go with the flow and say what you see to a certain extent, but more so, you know, why a certain thing has happened. Now, I want to get back uh, in a moment to that trust level with managers uh, that you yeah. talk about there. That's a really, really interesting point. But before we go there, I want to actually go back to another thing uh, that you touched on there, and that is your efforts to reach out uh, in, in your early years of doing commentary to other commentators, to great play-by-play -play voices, to great uh, co-coms of the game. Who were some of those people? And, and maybe could you share some of the, the most valuable conversations uh, that you had with those folks? Yeah, well, one of the first conversations I had was with Martin Tyler, you know, one of, one of the best of the lot. And, and I'm fortunate that I worked with him on, on quite a few Monday nights. And um, when I finished playing, I just got in touch with him, you know, because obviously I'd, I'd crossed paths with him when I was playing and he was doing our games and what have you. And I just asked him, you know, uh, we, had a, we had a conversation over the phone and said, do you mind, you know, just watching a few of my games? Um, and tell me where I'm going wrong. Tell me where I can improve because you know anything that, that he doesn't know isn't isn't really worth knowing. And that's from the commentary side and the co-com side as well because he is he's you know he's brilliant. He is the voice, um, no question about it. And I kid you not, every single game that I did that was on TV, he would text me afterwards. He used to watch whether it be watching it live or whether it be recording it. He would do that for me. And then what we would do, we'd have a chat over the phone on the Monday or the Tuesday or depending on what day it was. And he would just give me little nuggets of advice. I remember one of the early bits of advice that he gave me is that obviously you have you have a box next to you for all the different sounds from the directors, from the producers, from from the effects, from the from the stadium. And he just said to me, he said, your effects, he said, make sure you turn them right up. He said, turn them right up near enough to the point where you're actually fighting with the effects. Because then that's going to give you a greater gravitas. It's going to it's going to make you feel more involved because you're not going to be shouting, but it's going to be quite loud. And you know, and I think that's that's something that, that has stuck with me since then. And just little little things, you know, he always says to me about games. When you're doing the games, it's like it's like air miles. It's like flying a plane. You know, every game you do, you know, multiple games, you're going to get better at it. There's things that you'll learn. There's things that you'll understand. And it is a lot to do with experience. So I'll always be grateful for that from, from Martin. And, you know, people that you've mentioned, Derek Ray that's been on. You've got Peter Drury. Um Steve Bauer. There's just been there's been so many, so many um individuals that I've been very fortunate that I've been able to reach out to. Ian Dark as well was another one. And I think they appreciate the call because the one thing I can tell you, and I'm sure everybody else would, would say the same thing as well, is that the main commentator's job is by is by far the hardest of the two, of the commentary and the co-com, because you do your prep, you do everything that you need to do, but realistically, 65% of the time when you're on air, it's actually the main commentator's voice that you can hear. So the things that he has to be able to do um, and, and have the knowledge of and prep for is is far greater than what you have to do as, as the co-com. And I think one of the things that they appreciated and I understood was that it was nice for them because they, do, they want people to, to take it seriously because it is something that's very serious. You know, you're broadcasting to, to a number of people, a number of viewers. And I think they appreciate the fact that I wanted to learn from them and wanted to get their their perspective on how's best to do it. Well, as I'm listening to you tell these stories, Danny, you almost put Martin Tyler and, and Derek Ray and Peter Drury, great friends of the show, and Ian Dark and so many others. You almost put them in a similar light to, to the way that you've put great football managers uh, yeah. in, in past conversations uh, between us. Maybe talk about that a little bit more in terms of those men. It, it had to be. I know these are very, very humble uh, individuals that we're talking about, but it had to be a bit flattering, uh, maybe for lack of a better word, the fact that you were coming to them, almost putting them in a in a position of of being a, a sensei, a manager, and being able to, <laughs> to teach you a little bit. How did how did they react uh, uh, to that no. maybe maybe spread on that a little bit more yeah i think they they appreciated it and the thing like i say is that you know obviously coming into this is 
And me going back to being an apprentice. So I go back to when I was an apprentice as a footballer and you're right at the beginning of everything. You know, they, they, I came into this, obviously, you know, I played professional football for a number of years, but this was new. This was new to me. So I was never going to come into this and think, right, OK, this is going to be easy. So I just thought the best possible way to go about it is to speak to, to, to people that have the experience, that have the knowledge about it. And, you know, fortunately enough, I knew, I knew a few of them to a certain extent a little bit um from from when i was playing football and you'd be doing certain games and they would be there so you know we, we'd said hello and what have you and i think it wasn't so much surprise that i'd reached out i think it was the appreciation you know that i'd reached out because like you just said you know they're the best they're, they're the best in the business and one of the things that you will find with with cocoms is when you speak to people f- for advice there will be different bits of advice because co-commentary probably very much like commentary is it's something that can be done in many different ways and appreciated by different people. Now, certain people like a certain type of commentary and certain, certain other people will like a different style of commentary. So it's all dependent on what the individual wants. So if you're, you think you're going to go and speak to a commentator and they're going to tell you exactly what you need to do, it's very, very difficult. But the one thing that you find is when you speak to these top commentators, there'll be two or three things that they will say that mirror exactly what the other person says that you're speaking to. So then you know you're in the right lines. And then the other thing is just developing your, your, your own niche, developing your own character and just trying to be unique with what with what you do rather than copying anybody else. And I think that's really important. Well, bouncing off one one thing there, uh, you, you talk about your familiarity with some of these voices from back during your playing day and real quickly this is this is one of the only ones i, I want to know about uh or only, one of the only things i want to ask you about really relating to your playing career and it's 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 this danny when you were a player how much did you actually listen to football commentators how much did you actually listen for the opinions of football commentators in the way that they called your games or your colleagues games your teammates games how much were were you listening to them during your playing career it it was dependent on whether i had a good game or not i guess (laughs) (laughs) that would decide whether i'd uh, be listening in but but no you you do but what i would say now is that don't get wrong when i was playing it was only a few years ago social media was was apparent social media was around but now what you've got more than anything is social media is is even more at the forefront. So therefore, you don't only hear the commentators on the TV, you hear them on social media, on, on, on different different sites. So it's very difficult to, to not hear the commentators. But yeah, 100%, I think, I like to think that when I was playing that I was my own worst critic. So any commentator that had anything to say that was negative about me, it, it was never it was never an issue for me. But what I would say is that all the commentators that I've worked with, the ones that I've, the great ones that I've just mentioned, then they don't go out of their way to be critical. You know, I think you know they try and be as balanced as possible. I think that's important. I think people may think that they do, but I can guarantee one hundred percent none of them do. They want to go into each game as a neutral. They want a, they want to look at each team, each individual, and try and get the best out of them is in terms of the way they're going to approach the game and how they're going to speak about them. And that's something that I've really taken on board because I think that football, whether you're a player, whether you're a manager, people talk about the money that they earn and what have you. That doesn't take away the pressure. That doesn't take away the fact of, you know, you you are going to want to know what people are saying about you. So if you're going to be critical, one of the things that I've always thought since I've come into this, and I appreciate when I was a player, is that, be constructive with it. And I've never had any issues. So I've always thought to myself, you know, when it was a commentator and they may be saying something a little bit critical about myself, was it something I could handle? Yeah, not a problem at all. And that's what I've taken now to myself doing the commentaries. I always think to myself, right, if I'm going to be critical, how would I view this if this was said about me? If I would view it to be like, yeah, it's okay, I see it, it's constructive criticism, then that's absolutely fine. And it's always about balancing it out as well. You know, if you're gonna be if you're gonna give constructive criticism, always try and finish it on a good point. Just for example, if a if a player misses a, a sitter from four or five yards out, always finish it off with, he'll be really disappointed with himself because you know what? I've seen him score from thirty yards before. So all of a sudden you're getting that balance right. And I think that's really, really important. 
Well, you talked about that that bias and and the importance of of not having uh, that bias. I should say the importance yeah. of of making making sure that you're maintaining neutrality with your calls. I'm glad that you referenced the fact that your career was uh, not that long ago. You were far from ancient, Danny. You only retired <laughs> oh. back in in 2014. And and the reason why I bring that up is because you're calling games as a co-commentator. And there are I've I've heard you joke about this on the air with Martin Tyler. I've heard you talk about this in interviews uh, with with yours truly there's players on the pitch who you're quite familiar with there's guys who you used to play with guys who you watch come up and now they're coming into their primes or maybe they're getting a little bit towards uh, the end of their careers what's that like for you where you have so much inside knowledge about so many of these players as the guy who's actually holding the the co-commentary microphone and and knowing how to uh get the best of that how to harness the the best of of that knowledge while also maintaining neutrality when we're talking about guys who you know so well yeah i think it, it's it's important that you remain neutral but you know at times that can be difficult like you say if it's someone that someone that you know someone that you've played with but i, I liken it to probably to you know if i'm commentating on the team that i support at times you will actually go the other way and because you feel that people are going to be like, oh, well, he supports this team, so therefore he's going to really look after them, you actually tend to go the other way a little bit, which is, you know, may seem a little bit bizarre, just to try and prove that you are neutral. And But no, with, with, with players, a lot of the time, when it's players that you've known, players that you've played with, players that were at clubs when you were there, uh, maybe younger players, you, you treat everybody the same. You know, the, the difference is maybe you can give some insight from being in the dressing room with them, from being on the field with them about their decision making. So that's some of the insight that you can give. And I think that's important. But I just feel that it's very important that anything that you do is constructive um, and you're given a reason about why you're saying it. If you're going to give constructive criticism, don't just give it, say why you are giving it. And, you know, and, and because you've been in that situation before, as a defender, if a defender makes a mistake, I can you can guarantee if a defender makes a mistake on a pitch, I've made that mistake myself, probably numerous occasions. So you can relate to it. And what it gives you is a little bit of a little bit of an understanding of why maybe they made that mistake. And that's what you can get across. Because like I say, you know, my football career is finished and what have you, but the, the aspects of it that I still use now are experiences that I had on the pitch, whether it be making a mistake and wondering to myself, oh, why why have I done that? Or just getting myself out of position and why I ended up out of position. And then you can relate then to the player and that's something you can get across to the viewers instead of it just looking as though it's really bad play. To the, to the eye, it does look like really bad play, but there may be a reason why he's ended up in that position to allow a forward or a winger to get to get the better of him. So that is that's very important. And and also as well, I think it's I think it's key as a as a co-commentator to have a little bit of a dig at yourself every now and then. So if a player, you know, if, if a player gets the ball and goes to play down the line and kicks it into the stand, you know, just something like, oh, he's got my Adidas stand finders on, you know, because I think that's, <laughs> I think, I think that's important as well. Because what you have to remember is that these players that are on the pitch, they're human, they're going to make mistakes, and it's not about criticizing constantly with mistakes. It might be a case of putting yourself in their shoes and saying, yeah, well, you know what, this has happened many times to me before, and. You know, it's something I was known for or what have you, just to lighten the lighten the mood, because at the end of the day, whichever way you look at it, what we're doing, it's it's entertainment. Well, I'm glad you bring up the words understanding and relatability uh, mm. in, in regards to, to this particular conversation, because I want to transition back now to what you talked about in the uh, the opening of the show here. And that is that, quote unquote, trust level that you yeah. have to have with football managers, with with some of the most important and talked about individuals when it comes to commentary and and squad selection and tactics and and everything that goes in to the art of of football managing and and you have such a special role to play in in sharing much of that stuff with with the viewers with the audience so i i, I throw it right back to you danny what is it about the the tr trust level or how have you gained uh that trust level oh. with managers is there is there stuff from the past from your yeah. your playing career is there a certain mentality in play how have you gained that trust level i think you know i i think a lot, some, some of the managers will will remember or the majority of the managers will remember me as a player and what i would say is that you know i i i wasn't you know technically overly gifted 
so everything everything that you know I had was was being honest and, and what have you. I wasn't a player that could pick the ball up and take on two, three plays and create that bit of magic. You know, and I like to feel that, you know, I had the career that I had because because of my work ethic, not because I was a, an exceptional talent, because I was far from that. And and I think managers like that. I think they understand that. And then it's 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 all about the initial call. It's all about that first phone call. If they if they have if they've given you, you know, the okay to give them a call, that first call will make or break any trust that you can possibly get in the future. Um, because first and foremost, it's it's a talk about football. And I think what is great is that when you speak to managers, you may go off on a tangent. And although you've 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 rung them to, to talk about their team, to talk about, you know, the, the upcoming game for them, you may end up talking for half an hour, 40 minutes. And a large majority of that might just be about something else that, that's, that's in the spotlight to do with football. And it just seems to build from there. And I think the big thing is, is that what I'll always say to managers is that the majority of time when I speak to them, I'll actually say to them, do you mind if I, if I go through what we've spoken about? And then you please tell me if there are things I can't say or the rest of it is all right to say. And, you know, there are certain things that you know you don't need to, um, you, you know that you can't repeat, which is absolutely fine. And I think that's important. And then, you know, it's, it, it is, it's building understanding because the one thing is, is that, as a in in the role that I'm in now, if you not that I ever ever would, but if you ever stitched, stitched up a manager, no other manager would pick up the phone to you because managers talk. And the nicest thing for me is after certain games, after certain shows that I've done, a manager may text me and say, you know what, I thought what you did was really good there, or I've just watched back our game and you were really fair, you were really honest. And the majority of managers will say to me, I don't mind the criticism. They don't mind the criticism as long as it's constructive. And and I've probably done that over the last last four or five years, just building up understanding and relationships with managers that, you know, you, you build that trust. The more you speak to them, the more they have an understanding, the more they hear you, the more that they see you um, doing whatever you're doing. I think that's really important. And the biggest thing that I say to managers now is that the pressure on managers now is greater than ever. I think it's greater than ever, whether it be from the media, whether it be from the people that own the clubs, whether it be from the supporters, you are constantly in the spotlight. So why do I want to add to that? That's what I'll always say to manager. I don't want to add to that. I want to go into a game and I want to be able to speak highly about both managers, both sets of players. If a team's getting beat 5-0 and you can't do that. But my aim when that whistle is blown is to give insight, but to make it positive insight into how a manager is going about things. And... Sometimes speaking to a manager gives you a better understanding of why a team may not be doing so well or why a team is doing well. And dependent on what it is, you can explain that to, to the viewers or the listener, listeners. And that's fine because I know then when I'm speaking, I'm speaking with, not, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm speaking with, with matter of fact or speaking with importance, but I'm speaking with knowledge. I'm not saying anything that the manager wouldn't actually agree with because those words have come out of his mouth when he's mentioned them to me and I've written them down. Well, I'm glad you brought up there uh, a few moments ago, Danny, the the manager's union uh, that exists throughout English football and really throughout football all oh. around the world, but but specifically in regards to the modern Premier League and, and the culture of manager sackings and, and lack of patience uh, yeah. that, that we deal with here in the modern age. And, and I throw it right back to you. Is that something that you knew about as a player? Because you and I have, have talked ad nauseum about Sir Alex Ferguson and, and other great managers that you've played for. And folks remember in the 90s, the great Fergie Wenger rivalries, but those two guys, even them at the height of their powers, had the greatest of respect for each other. And and that's so true for for so many other managers. And and I think a lot of people might forget that. A lot of people might feed into the the feuds and feed into to the entertainment value and almost the the boxing like matchups uh, of football managers. Is is the concept of what you just touched on there, the the managers union. Um, is that something you knew about as a player? Is that something you've really learned more about through these conversations uh, in in your commentary career? Yeah, I see I see things very differently now. I think, you know, when you were a player, if you were playing against one of your one of your friends, for those ninety minutes, they weren't actually your friend. 
if that makes sense, if they're playing for the opposition, because it, it's it's part of football. You, you want your team to win, and you know your friend wants his team to win. It's as simple as that. Um, but what I've what I've really realised since finishing and speaking to managers is is just how hard the job is, because when you're a player, the biggest thing is are you playing? If you're playing, you know the manager's all right. If you're not playing, the manager's the, the manager's an idiot. <laughs> you know, and that's that, that, that's as simple as it can be. Whereas when you take a step back and when you start to look at the bigger picture and you're not a player anymore, you start to realise the job that a manager has. You know, he's got to manage. There, there's so many, there's so many different characters now within the game. The, the man management, and I've said it on numerous occasions, man management is the biggest thing. You know, because you can't, you probably can't act. Um, and you can't treat all players the way you used to be able to treat them, which was at times giving them a kick up the backside and then moving forward from there. Now you've got to know the individual play. You've got to know what makes them tick. You've got to make you've you've got to know what gets them going on the pitch. You've also got to look after the players that aren't playing. Probably more important than the players that are playing because the players that are playing are happy. Then you've also got to deal with the media and the good side. You know when when things are going well, but then the bad side when things aren't going so well. So I have a complete a complete and utter new respect for managers. I've always respected them, but I didn't realise how big a job they had to do. I always just thought as a player, right, okay, you know what we do? We do training during the week and we do the tactical side a day or two before the game and then the game and then that's it. And then we start a fresh week again, but it's not. There's so much that goes on off the pitch that, that managers have to take care of as well. So when you look at a lot of managers, you'll see they'll, you know, the, the opposition manager will go into his, his room after a game. They'll have a glass of wine and, and relax and what have you. And that's how it is. And, you know, and that's something that's, that's been very prevalent um, in the Premier League and I'm sure all around Europe for, for a number of years. Whether it is as much now, I don't know, because like I say, I'm, I'm not really in the tunnel that much after games now. But, yeah, it's something that's that's really important and I think that at times you, you see we still see it now when there's interviews managers will come out and speak and speak positively about other managers if they're under a little bit of pressure because you know that that's that's how it is we all know it's a high pressure job we all know that it's it's very short term now probably shorter term than it than it's ever been because people want instant success when in all reality it's very very difficult to get instant success sometimes you've got to build it brick by brick we're seeing what Jurgen Klopp is doing at Liverpool you know they're now going on to to be an unbelievably successful team Manchester United you know they're they're the other side of things where it's like it's a it's a rebuild now, but you have to keep a manager in place and you have to give him time to be able to do that because it's not just about training during the week. There's so many other things involved that then lead up to the game of the weekend. Well, I love that quote that you had uh, a few minutes back when you talked about if you if you stitch one manager up, another manager is going to hear about it, and that's that's really something that speaks to to that manager's union or, or that that coach's collective uh, that, that we talk about there. And and on that note, on on the note of of keeping that great rapport uh, with football managers of the conversations or uh, of the parts of them that are able to be shared uh, here on the podcast, Danny, what have been some of your uh, your favorite moments, whether in person or, or on those phone calls with managers? You said for sometimes it's you'll you'll go on for 20 minutes talking about something separate. Uh, from football what are the whether it's football related or not what are some of the most memorable uh, uh, chats that you've had with managers in the last it, few years it may be some it may be something that they've done during the week um towards the build up to the game towards the tactical side about certain plays and how they're doing how they are um how they're improving all the time um i'm just trying to think of some now oh i remember when i tell you what i remember when um when frank lampard first went to derby and and, and, and I asked him, I said, you know, going into management, and by the way, I, I think he's doing an outstanding job. You know, he, he's taken to it with, with, with complete and utter ease. And it was something I mentioned. I said to him, you know, what is what is the hardest part of, of management? And he said it, it, it's getting time on the pitch with players. He said, because when you when you speak to a lot of managers, the majority of managers will say that, they want you want to get more time on the training pitch, but because the the, the the matches come thick and fast, a lot of the actual tactical side of things, a lot of the build up that you do towards games, is actually based on stuff watching videos because you haven't got that time to actually get out on the pitch and and um, and 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 speak from that perspective. So you have to try and get in everything. Do you know what I mean? From from that side of things, um, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, I, I asked him when when obviously he became manager of, of United. I said, you know, what's do you feel do you feel the pressure? Because obviously it's a huge football club. And he was like, 
the biggest thing for me is that I enjoy. I enjoy my job. I love coming in every single day. You know, it, it's fantastic that I'm manager of this of this great club. He said the biggest thing for him is after a game, after a game, going in to see the great Sir Alex Ferguson and asking him his opinion of the game. You know, and and this is someone that's not in management now, the greatest manager that Manchester United have had and the most successful manager, one of the most successful managers that, that's ever been. And, you know, when you speak and, and, and like when you speak to, to Solskjaer and he says things like that, it's like, wow, that's that's really interesting because, you know, he, he played for him a number of years ago, but it's still the biggest thing is now going to see him after a game and getting his thoughts on it, which I thought was really interesting. Well, I love that quote, uh from Oli. I, I love your Alex Ferguson stories and, and we'll try to uh, close the show uh, with at least one. But you also mentioned there, uh, uh, you also mentioned the name Jurgen Klopp. What has your experience, Danny, been like uh, talking with Jurgen Klopp? Un- unfortunately, I haven't, I, you know, I've not had, I've not had the pleasure of like the one-on-one chats, but I remember, um, I think it was a few years, a few years ago now doing, I was doing pitch side for, for NBC, Manchester United v Liverpool. And he came over and He's, 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 he's infectious. You can see why players want to play for him. He's such an infectious individual. You know, you will have met people like that before where it's like when they talk, you listen. And the way that they talk, the manner in which they talk, the things that they talk about, it just excites you as an individual. And from my perspective, I was stood there and we were asking a few questions, um, you know, about the game and certain situations in the game. And you can just, I could just tell at that time, the more that he spoke, why players love him and why players do everything for him on the pitch, because he's just that type of manager that just, the minute he walks in the room, I think he just brings in so much, so much energy. And that was, that was really interesting to to speak to him and, and get that, just get that, you know, there, there was an awe around him when he spoke. It just got you, just got you excited about what he had to say. And you can see the energy that he has. You know, we, we see it on the touchline, we see it in his interviews. You can see the energy that he has on the touchline and when he's doing interviews. That's transmitted to the players then when they get on the pitch. And I'm sure it's transmitted to the players from a Monday to a Friday on the training ground as well. And it's 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 absolutely brilliant. And we're, we're so fortunate in the Premier League to have a manager like him. As we've got so many different characters within the Premier League, it, it's it's absolutely magnificent. Now, you mentioned Sir Alex Ferguson. I love that story that, that you shared from Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Um, Danny Higginbottom, the footballer. Danny, the commentator. And, and you, Danny Higginbottom, the human being. Um, I've, I've heard you mention uh, in, in regards to all of those aspects of who you are, uh, the influence that Sir Alex Ferguson has, has had on you as a footballer, as a commentator, as a human. Um, could you share that maybe with with folks who aren't as familiar uh, with the influence that that Fergie had on you and and what it what it means to this day? Yeah, it's you know I'm I'm forever grateful to him. You know I've, I've probably played maybe six seven times at, at United uh, in the first team, so it, it was never a case of me being constantly a first team player or anything like that. It was more the fact of when I was maybe eighteen nineteen. Um, I went over to Belgium and I played for a year um, at a team called Royal Antwerp, who had, a, who had an association with Manchester United. And we got to the playoffs to get into the top league. And there was a situation in a, in a playoff game where the referee had accused myself and, and, what, and one of the other players that was playing with me at the time, a lad called Ronnie Walwork, who was also from Manchester United. He'd thrown accusations our way of the, that, we'd, that, we'd, that we'd, you know, been out of order with him after the game, been physical as in terms of violence uh, towards him in the tunnel, which couldn't have been further from the truth. And we we both got banned for for a, for you know substantial amount of time, and that would have been the end of our careers before they'd even begun. And the first thing Sir Alex Ferguson did when we went back to manager uh, Manchester was he he called us both into his office, and he said, "I've known you both since the age of nine, which he had because we'd been at the club since that age," and he says, "I know that." This isn't something that that you would do. Um, so therefore, I want to give you, you know, something to, to relax you a little bit and to give you an understanding that, that, that we're here for you. We fight your corner and we we know that you haven't done anything wrong. And he gave us new four year contracts at the age of 20. And he didn't have to do that. Now, you have to remember that Sir Alex Ferguson was in the process of trying to make his team better. who had just won the treble, you know, the, the famous 99 treble. 
and he went out of his way he came over to belgium to the belgium fa to the the to brussels which is a glass house which is basically the equivalent of the english fa and he sat there um with referees uh, with secretaries from antwerp from other representatives from, from manchester united and he sat at one end of the table it was a really long table we were sat at the other end of the table and the referee and the linesman were sat either side of me and ronnie we had we had um we had somebody that would translate the language for us as the referee came out and told us all the things that we'd apparently done. Um, and at the time, the referee was FIFA listed. So, you know, Belgium's number one referee. So he was going to be believed and he was believed. Uh, but Sir Alex Ferguson stuck by us and the bans ended up being quashed very, very quickly because the referee refereed a couple of games early on in the new season in Belgium and was told to go and get psychiatric help um because of some of the decisions he'd made some of the things that he'd said about me and ronnie was putting it all on us that we'd done these things and it became it became very obvious you know there was too many holes there was too many cracks in what he was saying to to show that it was actually right what he'd said um and then the the bands got got quashed and you know that's from sir alex ferguson's perspective he didn't have to do that for us and I will be forever grateful for what he did because that was a really difficult time for me, a really difficult time for my family. And about about two years ago, I was on a train back from from London after I'd just done a show and I was going to my seat and he was sat there on his own. I hadn't seen him for quite a while. And I walked past him and he said, you know, hello, how's the family? I was like, yeah, you know, everything's great. I've heard, thank you, this and what have you. Hope you're well and all that. And as I walked past him, he just went, come and sit with me. And I had two hours sat down with him and it was... It was just amazing. It was no longer a manager looking at a snotty nose 17, 18 year old. It was <laughs> it was a legend of the game um, talking to somebody that had now come out of the game. And he, just the way he spoke to him was just brilliant. He, he remembered so much. And the nicest thing was, was that, you know, he said to me that I've heard quite a lot of the things that you do now and, and I'm really enjoying it. And I can't get a bigger compliment than that if I keep on doing what I'm doing now for the next 25, 30 years. But first and foremost, you know, the the, the 20 year old, 19, 20 year old that that he stood by, that he didn't need to stand by because he had so much going on. Um, be forever grateful for that. And, and so will the whole of my family because my career could have been over before it even began. So, you know, we'll always be held in the, the highest esteem from my perspective all the way through. My goodness, we talk about man management. What a sure. story that was, Danny. Thank you so much for, for sharing that, giving me chills uh, throughout. Felt like I was a fly on the wall for that whole thing. Um, I couldn't think of a better way to uh, to wrap this up, sir. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I love it. Thank you, Danny. We'll talk to you soon. Danny. And that's going to do it for episode three of The Heart of the Game. Another huge thank you to our good friend, Danny Higginbottom. For everyone at WorldSoccerTalk.com, this is Nate Abarea signing off from the cross-border community of San Diego and Tijuana, Baja California, Mexico. It's The Heart of the Game. Bye for now. <laughs> <laughs>